Um, welcome everybody to this Validator Connect call. Um, I know we've had these in the past. Uh, in this one, we really want to focus on um, some of the uh, upcoming changes, the release of Casper 2.0, what to expect. Uh, actually, let me um, dive into uh, an agenda. We'll start with a quick introduction by me. Um, then we'll go into Casper 2.0, um, the scope and development status by uh, our head of engineering at Hastings. Uh, we will go over um, a consensus, a Zoo consensus overview um, with our consensus engineer Alexander Liminov. Uh, Mihao will provide a, a preview of the VM 2.0, and Joe Sacher will. Um, provide an update on what rollout is going to look like for uh, validators, node operators, and what to expect and prepare for, uh, followed by Q&A. Um, so let's uh, go here. Um, what is new? So there's obviously a lot that has been happening uh, in and around Casper over the last uh, couple months. Uh, that includes um, personnel changes, my own uh, joining of the team as the CTO, et cetera, et cetera. One of the biggest um, changes that uh, I think everybody is aware of by now is the clearer delineation that we've implemented between Casper Association and Casper Labs. Um, in the past, as many of you know, um, there was uh, shared responsibilities between uh, multiple entities, which has led to less than optimal execution at times. Um, since the last few months, the Casper Association is the uh, sole responsible party for core engineering. Uh, all resources have been brought under the CA's uh, management where, with regards to core engineering, uh, which has led to and will continue to lead to a much more uh, focused and concentrated uh, effort without any uh, distractions of other uh, priorities. So that, that's the main takeaway there. Uh, we've also announced our renewed focus on mass market use cases, uh, which is sort of a side effect of this delineation where um, under previous circumstances, um, there was a lot of focus on enterprise only um, use cases, and uh, we are heavily invested in uh, both time, effort, and attention into uh, much broader use cases going forward. Um, we have refined the scope of Casper 2.0 uh, in the last couple of months uh, with a clear focus on um, getting it launched. Um, and getting it launched in a way that um, makes it as seamless as possible for the downstream ecosystem. And we'll get into that a little bit more uh, throughout this, um, this discussion. Uh, we have doubled down on uh, community engagement and participation in decision making. This means, uh, means a few things. Uh, we've launched the Casper Fans application. Um, this uh, stat that you see here is actually already out of date because we just passed 300,000 users uh, today. Uh, it has uh, proven to bring a lot of new engagements to our various communities, um, which um, has a number of uh, positive side effects uh, that we can talk about later. Uh, we have launched the Casper Forum, which is really a central place for um, all stakeholders to participate in and engage around important topics for the Casper ecosystem and um, influence and determine outcomes uh, in a collaborative and community fashion. Uh, this is a first step towards uh, much fuller decentralized decision making, which we've also announced in the last couple of weeks. Um, there will be an interim board uh, that will take uh, over um, in the Casper Association uh, in the very near future, which has a uh, mandate to further decentralize decision making in a pretty innovative way uh, under Swiss Association law. Um, details about that are uh, available on Casper.network under the blog. Um, and we have massively increased our engagement with the community. We've had multiple AMAs over the last couple of weeks. We are uh, planning these recurring meetings like uh, this Validated Connect call. We've st started our uh, DeFi working group. First meeting took place last week. And um, there's a lot of um, sort of palpable um, momentum going on there, including with uh, a number of exciting new projects coming online. 
um, and so on. Uh, I already talked about the relative decentralization uh, that's in motion. Uh, details can be read online. Um, one of the things that we've also done as a result of the changes in the last couple of months is uh, changes to our development process. And this is, um, I'll give you the breakdown here. So um, because uh, there were multiple organizations um, in charge of various aspects of core engineering, there were also multiple methodologies and owners and processes and tools and rituals being used. Uh, alongside each other, sometimes handed over from one to the other. Uh, things, um, as you might, ima might imagine, um, got a little messy that way. Uh, we have uh, improved this by going to a single uniform methodology and single tooling, single source of truth, um, and have the ability now to actually identify full scope of completed work and also know what our backlog looks like. Um, as uh, for those of you who are also in engineering, you, you can probably appreciate how uh, important uh, just knowing what you have done and what you're working on, what the priorities are and what you're about to do uh, can be. Um, we have also decided to switch uh, back to regular semantic versioning. So Condor uh, will be the last named release. It's essentially uh, Casper 2.00. Uh, going forward, we will use standard semantic versioning where uh, non-breaking, non-new feature um, changes such as configs and, and bug fixes go into patch releases. For example, uh, 2.0.1 uh, is the uh, most likely expected next version after 2.00. Uh, then planned new features and functionality go into minor releases, um, so 2.1.0. And then major backward incompatible upgrades and major releases are uh, major versions, right? So that would be 3.0 and onwards. Um, then we are uh, finally in a position to using number one and number two here in this list to do proper uh, backlog uh, and roadmap and release planning. So uh, we can we have a back backlog of features. We uh, have version based releases. We can now map features to releases and put that out there, and uh, everybody, both internally as well as externally. We'll know um, what's coming up next, in what order, in which release, and what to expect. Uh, and obviously, uh, this is a, uh, a living uh, process, meaning it uh, it will be put out there, but nothing in, in engineering is ever set in stone, right? So these things will be uh, reviewed periodically as priorities and, and information changes. Um, then, um, just reiterating what the Casper 2.0 objectives are. Um, obviously, uh, if we look at the middle here, we want to provide improvements and solutions in important areas, and we're about to go into what those are. Um, as I mentioned, we are uh, really eager to ship, and we know that uh, this release has been postponed uh, and delayed for uh, quite a while. Um, at the same time, we don't want to break the ecosystem, right? So these are all sort of um, uh, forces that are essentially uh, pushing in different directions. But the most important thing here is that we're going to innovate and improve. This is going to get shipped um, this quarter. We have some updates on, on timing in this call. Uh, and we are uh, doing a lot of things to make this as seamless as possible. Um, with that, I would like to uh, hand the mic to Ed Hastings, our head of engineering, who is going to walk us through the scope of Casper 2.0, uh, as well as development status. Ed, the floor is yours. Can you hear me? We can hear you. OK, yeah. So basically, uh, 2.0, the scope was set a couple years ago in uh, London. And then over time, some of the original scope got cut and some other things have been added. Um, but essentially where we're at uh, today is all of the scoped items have been implemented uh, or, you know, the things that remained in the scope uh, from uh, that original uh, work, as well as some new things were added on around uh, validator uh, bid management and so forth that, that came along later. Uh, there is one uh, new item that came along very recently that we're starting work on. Um, 
that was not part of the original scope and everything else is is uh, essentially merged to the feature branch uh, so high level like the main focus of 2.0 was to address various architectural issues um, in the 1x uh, or the genesis launch uh, that were essentially uh, deemed impediments to uh, future change or that were essentially preventing us from implementing various things that people wanted um, and uh, we also ultimately from what was scoped in London for 2.0 we, we were able to include quite a lot of that in 1.5 actually so we got to jump on uh, that and a lot of the things that went into support fast sync were actually taken from the set of architectural changes and then the remainder in in 2.0 were the ones that required a breaking API change to any of the various public APIs, uh, which we weren't able to do in 1.5. Some of the big ticket items for this is uh, essentially in 1x, the RPC is in, it's a uh, essentially an HTTP server embedded into the node itself, um, and um, services you know essentially JSON RPC requests. Uh, we've pushed that out of the node. Uh, the main reason is because the inclusion of it within the node uh, entailed changes to the RPC's uh, endpoints to essentially the protocol version. Uh, it made it very difficult for us to make even rudimentary changes that you would expect to be able to make on a web uh, platform. Uh, so essentially by pushing uh, that out of the node, it protects the node from that sort of volatility and also makes it uh, so that we can be more responsive on changing uh, or adding, extending the RPC, right? Uh, and then basically there's a sidecar that has uh, various functionality uh, around event listening uh, uh, and uh, storage of uh, data that's not otherwise uh, stored on the node, ephemeral data, metadata, uh, and it's been extended to essentially uh, take on uh, that RPC server in addition to what it was already doing. Um, and then essentially from the operator's point of view, it just sits in front of the port uh, that we've opened on the node, the binary port, that accepts really low level messages uh, that translates, um, essentially the sidecar translates the incoming JSON requests into those binary requests and translates the binary responses into a JSON response. So this gives a lot of protection. It acts as like a circuit breaker on the node itself. If um, you know someone's trying to hammer or DOS uh, that RPC server, uh, it won't take the node down. Uh, and uh, similarly, if there's a uh, entry point that needs to be added or there's some uh, modification that needs to be made to uh, the presentation layer uh, because it's independent from the node itself, it doesn't require a protocol upgrade. So uh, it's also possible and um, even recommended for systemic function that requires high speed if the uh, operator of the node uh, allows uh, the binary port to be accessed uh, by other entities uh, or even their own software, well, then that offers you a much faster, uh, higher, you know, just a higher performant um, way to communicate with the node. Uh, on the other hand, if you have existing tooling that's um, essentially designed to work with the JSON RPC, it should continue to work against uh, um, the uh, API because you can't tell the difference, right? It's sitting at the same IP address and you don't know the difference. Uh, so it's effectively a shim. Uh, We've also uh, changed the block structure to allow the block body uh, to have different lanes. In the 1x model, the current model, uh, there's essentially just a list of transactions. Um, they're split between native transfers and everything else. Uh, the issue there is, is that everything else has to then be a size to the largest thing it could be, which would generally be an installer uh, or an upgrade, you know, a contract installer upgrade. Uh, and which means we have to be very conservative around how many uh, general deploys we can accept per block, and we can't do any real optimization around that. So in 2.0, uh, the block structure just allows for various lanes, and the lanes are sized. Uh, and so basically, native function, which is very cheap, uh, doesn't require, it has no WASM. Uh, we can obviously support more of those. Uh, in 1x, we have support for the native transfer. and 2x, we've extended that to support for native auction. So you can do, uh, you know, all auction interactions, add bid, withdraw bid, um, delegate, undelegate, et cetera, directly without requiring any WASM at all using that functionality. And because it's part of the block structure, it's a guarantee that no matter what else is going on, some amount of auction activity uh, will always occur. So it also protects the system. Uh, from people attempting to fill up blocks to prevent auction interaction, right? 
Um, and then basically from the sizing point of view, uh, it basically creates the opportunity for um, uh, submitters of trans, oh, that's another big thing. Today, they're all called deploys. Um, the When we built the chain, there was, you know, people, some some things called deploy, some called transactions. Uh, we went with deploy, and, and in the meantime, uh, transaction has become the dominant. So we just went ahead and renamed it um, as part of 2.0. So the transaction notion is just the, the same as the deploy notion. You create a transaction, you sign it, you send it. The structure of the transaction is different. It's more future extensible um, so that we can support other future changes without having to do a complete breaking change. Um, but generally, the, the semantics and usage of it are the same, right? So transactions that are coming in um, uh, that essentially are identified as being large um, uh, will go into a, a large lane and so forth so forth. If they're small, they go into small. And right now, we're doing, you know, T-shirt sizes. But it's adjustable, configurable for the chain spec. And so uh, we have some room to play around in that. Uh, the size of the lane determines, you know, how many of them we will, we can potentially maximally attempt to fit in a block and what gas limit uh, applies and how much that should cost, right? Uh, so it just adds uh, optimization opportunities uh, to where we can uh, do a better fill on the block and not have to be so conservative, assuming, well, what if every received transaction is an installer, right? Um, OK, the next bit is uh, auction, uh, the, the current mechanism that we use for auction. Uh, functions, but it is not efficient in terms of size. Um, and certain operations, uh, if you're particularly, uh, specifically when you're dealing with delegators, uh, because of the way they're currently stored, requires the fetching of a significant amount of data. Uh, to do any work on a delegation bid today requires um, essentially a, a, a lookup and uh, deserialization of the validator and all of the other delegators' uh, data to just work with that one delegator is extremely inefficient. Uh, and then it uh, also causes uh, size on disk issues when it gets written back. So uh, essentially, the uh, uh, 2.0 uh, addresses that by making delegator bids a top level concern. They're separate entries in global state rather than being embedded within the validator. Uh, this also allows. Um, you know, in most situations, it's more efficient. Uh, you know, when you're uh, operating on a specific delegator, uh, only that delegator's information needs to be retrieved. Uh, in a couple of scenarios, uh, it's slightly uh, more computation intensive, uh, intensive to go after uh, all of the delegators because we have to essentially iterate over them rather than just dehydrate a single record. But on the whole, uh, overall, um, it's a win, right? And it's definitely a win on disk. It, it takes a lot less uh, space on disk. Now, all of the, because it's a blockchain, all of the previously written records must remain. Uh, but going forward, um, essentially, we will uh, burn less disk, uh, significantly less disk doing auction interactions, which sustains the, the chain of the future. Uh, and then at point of upgrade, uh, the upgrade process will roll through all existing active bids. Um, and essentially migrate them into the structure um, uh, uh, that I just described. Uh, also, uh, currently in 1x, uh, we don't support pruning in global state. Um, in 2x, that's been fully integrated. That's particularly useful in the auction uh, because today, uh, because we can't prune away the entries at root uh, at global state root. Uh, any bid that's been reduced to zero still exists and must be looked at. So whenever we run the auction, whenever we're looking for delegators, if there's ever been a bid uh, and it's currently at zero, we still have to look at it to then toss it because it exists. Uh, and so with the pruning capability pushed down into global state, we now have the ability to prune those away, which helps significantly. It uh, gets rid of uh, cruft and prevents, um, you know, just essentially iterating over dead records, right? Um, Next bit that we've implemented is uh, a much requested feature, which is for natively supported uh, events coming out of contracts with host enforcement of, you know, essentially uh, source to prevent re repudiation. In other words, it should not be possible for uh, the someone to say, I didn't say that. Um, and similarly, uh, it should be possible to spoof uh, to basically make it seem like uh, you know, produce a message and make it seem like someone else uh, said it, which uh, today the the user land event conventions people have worked out are pretty good, but they can't overcome that 
specific issue because they don't have that power. Uh, so now the host supports um, uh, this. It uses a message topic model, so contracts can set up you know however many message topics they want, uh, and then emit messages on that topic, which then get turned into uh, events that get put to the event stream. Uh, what we actually store on chain uh, is essentially a hash and a count. Uh, so there's a scheme uh, where every message and in what order uh, they were emitted uh, from a particular transaction's execution are stored um, uh, at the hash level. And then the events coming off the event stream are the full message. And effectively, uh, you can do checksums. You could say, you know, at this block height, did this source say this thing and ask uh, the node and, uh, you know, a node on the network and it will tell you yes or no. Yeah, they did say that thing or no, they didn't. Um, and it's essentially doing a, a checksum uh, to determine that, right? Um, and then not only did they say this thing, but did they say it in this order, right? So you get into scenarios where depending on the timing of a contract calling a contract, calling another contract and things like that, um, the order matters. And so you can get quite specific and say, did they say this thing at this time in this order? Right? Um, and then uh, we've added some new FFIs, uh, you know, significantly, or to be clear, the, the FFI is at the um, host level. Um, yeah, OK, I'll wrap that up. Uh, it's at the host level. Uh, that's what the WASMs interact with. So we've uh, added new FFIs to interact with the new functionality I just described. We've also added uh, some additional utility support uh, for some uh, different hashing mechanisms, which is something people have requested. Uh, we've also added an FFI that will allow a smart contract to ask for things like block height, uh, the parent hash, and so forth, which can be useful for a variety of things and can also be used as part of a seed if you want some pseudo random behavior in your contract. Uh, another big item that we've got some other slides for later is the Zug consensus protocol, which is a, a new consensus mechanism that we're um, essentially we've integrated. Um, we've also added support for a user land feature uh, to be able to burn a token. Um, and we've also got within the code base um, support uh, for a new VM we're planning to go live with um, in the next minor patch and uh, some other uh, high-end features that we're currently turning off for launch but are essentially enabled in the chain spec, which is a, a merger of accounts and contracts, which turns on a variety of new behaviors. Um, and then the gas fee elimination uh, logic, which essentially uh, uses holds um, instead of taking a uh, token for gas. Um, and there was a question that went by something about Hedera. Yeah, I, I think we should probably just handle questions at the end. Anyway, so that's... There, there's a Q&A at the end. <laughs> yeah, so I've got the, uh, the scope laid out. Um, and then since we're taking questions at the end, I'm ready to pass on to the next speaker. Sure. Thank you very much, Ed. And uh, I think, uh, well, speaking on behalf of myself, but I think of uh, many, we're very excited about uh, the upcoming feature sets and uh, very appreciative of all the hard work that you and, and the core engineering team have put into this. Um, a quick question from Bogos chat. Uh, is it possible to share the slides? Yeah, we can uh, share the slides afterwards. Uh, there will also be a recording uh, that will be uh, made public, as well as a written summary. Um, there are two uh, topics here as part of the 2.0 scope that uh, Ed highlighted that we want to dig a little deeper into. The first one is the Zook consensus protocol. Um, and we are joined by Alexander Limonov, who will uh, walk us through that. Alexander, the floor is yours. Uh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, let's see. Well, uh, so this section is going to be actually relatively light, since thankfully uh, Zoog is in fact a fairly light consensus protocol. Uh, so to remind ourselves what this thing actually does in the abstract, right? I mean, what is a consensus protocol? Some set of rules that enables the actual agreement, uh, you know, and some value by some distributed set of participants, right? In our case, of course, participants are nodes. Right, and these different nodes, uh, you know, they can receive different inputs, right? Some external messages uh, or, you know, protocol-specific messages. 
Uh, and uh, the goal of the set of rules uh, is to make sure that eventually they all output the same values as they agree on, right? I mean, this is a guarantee of safety. Uh, they should do this within some finite time, which is a guarantee of liveness. And this whole thing should be resilient against, you know, participants that become faulty, malicious, or, you know, overly strategic, right? So this is Byzantine fault tolerance. Right, so now specifically for blockchains, uh, right, I mean, uh, what are the specifics, uh, you know, from the previous side? I mean, nodes receive, you know, consensus messages from other nodes, uh, and they uh, receive uh, transactions uh, from users, uh, gossip from other nodes. All right, so eventually, uh, you know, after the nodes do what they do, uh, uh, the nodes should have basically a technical internal state, uh, right, which is basically just, you know, some Merkle to try a uh, bag database. Uh, and they should have output, you know, uh, identical, you know, public uh, block histories that list, you know, the transactions and which orders were, uh, you know, supposed to be executed. Uh, and then, you know, obviously the result of their execution is, in fact, you know, the, uh, the internal state should also be identical. Right. I mean, so the network needs to continue to process all this correctly, you know, add in the blocks and, you know, evolve in the internal state in accordance to, you know, the transactions that actually get executed. And so, uh, yeah, now we can move to the specifics of Zug on the next slide, right? So, uh, Zug, and the, you can read the, uh, you know, we obviously, you know, we'll probably pass this around and, you know, you can read the paper. Now, note that the paper is actually quite abstract, right? So, you, if you're really interested in the details, you may want to actually just uh, read our, you know, implementation in Rust. It, it would, uh, you know, maybe be a little bit easier to understand. Uh, right, but so, but uh, how does Zug work? Uh, well, relatively simply, right, we have just as before, just as in highway, uh, leader proposes, uh, you know, some value, right? I mean, which is, you know, a list of transactions essentially that, uh, you know, should be executed, right? Which, you know, is a block uh, and broadcasts it to all other participants. Uh, everybody else uh, sends a message called an echo, right? I mean, it's also broadcasted, uh, you know, basically in response to the first proposals they actually see. Right. Uh, once uh, you know a node observes this, uh, you know a proposal. Uh, you know that the two thirds of the nodes by weight, basically, uh, you know, have uh, echoed some proposal. Uh, well, the moment you see it, uh, you you send the message here, but it says you know we, we vote that this is you know this is true, right? I mean, this we should uh, basically put this uh, proposal uh, in our uh, block history. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you don't see uh, the quorum being reached, uh, you said, no, we should not include this, right? And uh, if there is, in fact, uh, you know, uh, this, you know, vote true, uh, you know, from a quorum uh, and everybody observes this, right? I mean, they consider it finalized, you know, produce uh, finality signatures and basically that whole thing just gets added uh, to, uh, to our blockchain, right? I mean, so the interesting thing about Zug is that if you reach a quorum of uh, false votes, uh, the particular round uh, in which, uh, you know, this uh, voting process takes place uh, is uh, marked as skippable, right? And the proposals from the skippable rounds, they may actually still become ancestors of future proposals, right? And thus eventually become finalized, but they don't have to, right? I mean, the next round that's created, you know, whenever, uh, you know, basically, whenever, uh, you know, some time passes, right, or, you know, immediately, uh, if the round becomes skippable, uh, you know, eventually somebody might come around and make a proposal that includes yours as an ancestor, and then the whole thing would be finalized, so the proposal is finalized. Uh, or, you know, possibly nobody comes around and somebody picks, you know, a different, uh, you know, uh, either a proposal after the skippable one uh, or, you know, one before that, and there's, a, you know, the proposal in the skippable around essentially, uh, you know, it never gets included in the history. Uh, but the, the thing is that this allows you to basically kind of, uh, you know, kind of hop over these, uh, you know, rounds where perhaps there was a network partition or something similar uh, that prevented, uh, you know, the voting process from completing correctly on time. Uh, so, uh, and I think on the, next, uh, on the next slide, I think we have, yes, yeah, so this is actually right. The, the, the advantages are very simple, really, right? I mean, so first of all, uh, you know, I think I was able to give like a fairly, uh, you know, you know, a comprehensive actually explanation of the type of messages that uh, get sent around in Zug. And uh, if you have ever attended a presentation on highway, uh, you know that explaining the highway is a nightmare. But the reason it's a nightmare uh, is because there's a lot of complicated things going on and the complicated things result in a lot of, 
you know, just consensus related networking overhead, which slows things down, and the Zoom eliminates a lot of that, right? I mean, you know, it, it's still, you know, there's still fundamental limits that you run up to, but it is, uh, you know, it basically should be faster than highway, right? Which has knock on effects that, you know, uh, later, you know, potentially, if people want this, you know, you could, for example, do things like expand the, you know, uh, the validator set, uh, you know, or maybe decrease block times, or, you know, at the very least, when you're, you know, considering decreasing block times, you would only be bound by the, you know, VM performance and not the consensus performance, right? I mean, so there are a lot of, uh, it, it's a feature that uh, enables, uh, you know, potentially major improvements down the line, but uh, kind of on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, you know, everything should work roughly speaking as it does now, right? I mean, if you just observe the chain, you would not necessarily know that, uh, you know, there was a switch over to Zoom, right? Uh, and so, yeah, basically, there are a few other things that, uh, uh, we may want to talk about, uh, uh, you know, about that are related in the future, and some of you may have had uh, those meetings with me where I presented things about the economic changes that are somewhat related to this, but that we will leave that for future presentations. I was speaking with my mic off. I was uh, saying thank you, Alexander, very much uh, for that overview. Um, if there are any questions, we'll take those at the end. Uh, we're going to continue on with uh, Mihao Papieski, who is going to give us a preview of the VM 2.0. Mihao, go for it. Hi. Uh, in in 2.0, we already shipped two VMs. Uh, there is existing virtual machine, the, the current one. Uh, we will call it like V1. Uh, we will have new VM uh, wired up and integrated into the code. So. Uh, uh, you could be able to create new transactions with it already, but it's not activated in the chain spec, so it will be disabled. So if we plan to activate it around 2.1. Um, there will be probably DevNet already working before, somewhere be, uh, between 2.0 and 2.1, maybe earlier, depends on the priorities. And so this will give us ability to to have like extendable uh, uh, node with possibly other VMs in the future. Um, in the transaction, you will indicate what VM you will target. Uh, there is there will be a new field uh, called runtime, which you will you you, you can change uh, depends on your needs. Um, and there will be backwards compatibility. Uh, uh, as currently implemented in, in the in the peer I have open for quite some long for quite some time, uh, it is possible for VM2 to call into VM1 stored contracts. So you can, uh, at, at, at least now uh, in, in current implementation, you, you should be able to um, migrate some state, call some entry points, extract some data, or just make some proxy to, to call old contracts from new contracts. So um, it is still uh, working progress, basically. Um, what, but what, what, what are the problems with the current engine? Uh, it is largely unchanged since the early days of the project. Uh, there were some, uh, there were many decisions that made sense on paper, but in the practice, it, they were very hard to understand, hard to explain, hard to maintain. There are a couple of instances of that. For example, UREFs, uh, new VM wouldn't have UREFs anymore. So, uh, the, the issue with VTRF was that uh, it is supposed to store data, but it is basically forever uh, because you can't reclaim it. If I will give you URF, then we we don't keep track of that. We don't keep keep track of the of the ownership. So uh, the, the the best idea was to just get rid of URFs. Um, as consequence, horses are gone. Uh, account will have only one. Course, our contract will have only one course. Uh, there will be better isolation, more predictable costs. Uh, currently, um, there is some. some uh, currently, some some types are tangled between the contract API. So whenever we change something in the types we use, it might affect the costs. So um, in in the new new design, the storage and other components are isolated from from the implementation details. So it will give us also more flexibility, especially around migrating state and and uh, and uh, uh, some internal changes. Uh, we wouldn't be afraid to change something uh, because it might affect the costs, right? 
Um, the focus will be on side level code rather than low level, uh, although low level will be still possible. Hopefully, the, the model will be still easier to understand than, than the current one. Uh, so think of objects, traits, uh, um, idiomatic rust rather than some extend C, no Mongol, FN uh, stuff. Um, and there will be some missing features implemented that are probably de facto standards currently in blockchain space, especially in wasm based blockchains, let's say uh, payable, uh, we will call it transferable entry points where you can transfer tokens into an entry point and then react upon the received value. So think of, let's say, dropped Casper. Uh, it will be easy to write as a sing single entry point call, but in V1, uh, it might be really hard to do without some custom session code. Uh, there will be schemas. Uh, so th so the, the contract you will, you will write will produce a schema. Uh, there will be some tooling uh, to extract schema from contract. Uh, so this way we can preserve uh, type information, uh, entry point names, and, and other information. And there will be some improvement to contract updates, also uh, to uh, some patterns around factories this way. Uh, we will basically, the idea is that uh, the contract will decide to perform upgrade. So then you can do any custom checks you want. If it's an owner, if you are owner or you are part of some group, if you have ICS, it's, it's, it's the up to contract to decide who is able to perform the upgrade. And there will be some better testing story. I think uh, 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 you should be able to just, you need, so since I, I mentioned the focus you know, is on high level code, a better testing story means that you can just unit test your code and that should be, uh, that should also lower the barrier to entry to, to do testing. Uh, and there's more. Uh, so, so the best to, to illustrate uh, what's the idea is to show you the, the existing example of a contract. It is a simple counter on the D1 execution engine. And you can see there's lots of uh, uh, noise, I, I would say, uh, that you have entry point, let's say increment, decrement, uh, uh, increment and get, right? But there is a lot of startup code you can see. And uh, yeah, and this is the idea of, of the, the V2 engine that we hopefully it will decrease the noise. You can focus on your business logic. You can also do some testing as part of that. And so, so the, basically the idea here is to, uh, if you really remove the annotations, if you really remove the annotation of Casper, uh, then basically it should be still valid trust in my opinion. Uh, so it is a very simple example, but uh, in my PR, in, in, you could find more examples in my PR on GitHub. Basically, you can also do, uh, there's an example of CP18 port that basically, if you want to write a token, it's as simple as do something like import CP18 for my token. And uh, yeah, that, that will, there will be some, sh that, that, that way you can raise some logic and uh, it should all work. And you can see there's a constructor which will be called upon creation of the contract. So there is some like, initial logic for the state of the contract. Um, and each, each method, like let's say it's a pub fun func, then uh, it is an entry point, right? Arguments uh, are basic. I, I mean, it's, it's, it is just argument, right? There's no named arc as well. Uh, there is some details to that, but uh, basically argument is just bytes of the argument, not overhead of named, named argument plus some, some more information. <clears throat> and uh, the, the idea, so since there is no URFs, the idea is that you should be able to return information uh, through entry points rather than share URFs. Uh, and at the bottom, you can see uh, there is a unit test. So as I said, you can test it just like any other Rust code. Uh, there is no magic there. Um, and there is some quality of life improvement as well. There is no requirement of a session code just to set up a contract. You can just compile this, as you can see on the screen, and send it to the network, and it will be set up for you. It will be a contract already. So uh, it could also minimize some extra code or some. It, it could definitely some data as well. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, let me just want to emphasize, as a last point, I want to emphasize on the importance of trust. Like, it is hopefully, um, I'm trying to make it as much idiomatic trust as possible, just so you don't need to read, uh, you, just so you don't need to learn from custom APIs and custom logic that you will basically learn custom. Um, custom APIs just to write your contract. It's, it, 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 I'm trying to simplify your life so you don't need to learn both things, Rust and some custom APIs. I want you to just be productive. If you know Rust or if you want to learn Rust, you should be able to write a smart contract on the network. And yeah. Um, that's an amazing overview, Mihao. Uh, and uh, I know how much uh, work has gone in uh, into this. Uh, it's going to be a massive improvement for the uh, developer experience. And um, we're excited about uh, getting this out, uh, as you mentioned, around uh, 2.1. Yes. Um, thank you very much. Uh, next up is uh, Joe who is going to walk us through the Casper 2.0 rollouts. Quick sound check, sound it okay? You sound great. Okay, so uh, Ed had talked about one uh, additional feature we're tagging on to RC5, uh, looking at cutting that next week. Uh, our internal network testing is done by standing up nodes, uh, small to large, 120 nodes is a pretty big, uh, set up to spin up and test and go down. And what we're doing is periodically taking uh, cuts of feet 2.0. We've been doing that for some time. So what that allows us to do is the testing, when we get to a, an actual pinned uh, version that we think is good, we've, we've pretty much verified it. We don't expect uh, many surprises there. So once we verified RC5, uh, we'll have that on DevNet which will be upgraded from a mainnet snapshot. So we'll be able to see uh, what mainnet data from some point in the past, it won't be, uh, you know, well, one week old, it'll probably be, you know, longer, but you'll be able to see some conversion, uh, what that looks like uh, post upgraded uh, versus what's on mainnet. So that would show the the different looks of historical data, uh, that sort of thing. Um, then uh, the actual rollout to node operators, um, we have some cruft in uh, repo.casperlabs.io, and as people separate, and uh, you know, myself and many others go to association work, we're also doing that infrastructure conversion over there. Uh, so we're going to be standing up a new Debian repo. Uh, I expect it to be repo.casper.network. Um, that will uh, need to be added in, you know, with a normal Debian pointer. Uh, type of, you know, for any of the repo pieces. We'll likely put a new place where the hosts, the packages are hosted and pulled down, but that's going to be more seamless than the repo. Uh, we'll just have a standard HTTP redirect for that. Um, right now, we have two locations that we host those. Uh, I haven't talked with Michael. Likely, we'll combine those maybe to a Casper network common host for testnet, mainnet, integration test, all of that. Uh, so we're formalizing those processes. And uh, as you know, Michael alluded to in the past, the the separation of interest among different groups have made some uneconomies of scale, which we're going to optimize and improve with some of this reorient reorientation of the network pieces. The Casper node launcher as it exists should work correctly for upgrading and it would redirect across when it pulls down the packages, but we have no real fundamental changes to that. Uh, we may clean up some quality of life pieces with the scripts on it and also point to the new location. Uh, the client in the sidecar will need to be upgraded. Uh, client obviously has to talk to the new RPC, uh, the new block formats, all of those pieces. The sidecar, as Ed talked about, is what goes in and can translate the new binary port to RPC. That's the primary uh, piece that node operators will use it for. And the default install for that is going to be RPC on, but the database and the storage of the event stream image, the event stream events is going to be off. And the main reason for that is we're not going to fire up a database and store events for somebody just installing a package, right? 
you have that option to do that, but we don't want a, a growing disk use for somebody that's not using that. And when you install the Casper sidecar and it detects that an older version of the node is running that is still using the 7777 port, it's just going to sit there and kind of wait in a waiting mode and be running as its own uh, package there. Once it detects that the node goes down and it no longer is, is supporting 7777, it would see the binary port come up on 7779. And then it would instantiate that RPC 7777 process and be the new RPC server. So that allows the node to seamlessly cut across. And one thing we have to be careful of is any nodes that were an RPC target for actual work on the network at an upgrade point, they still need to be a target, right? Uh, you have the option of firewall limiting, you know, all the different pieces. And uh, you would have an option of, you know, modifying how the sidecar runs in those different pieces. And as Ed also specified, you have an option of opening that 7779 for more efficient communication. But likely that would be done uh, on a you know, read-only node, non-validating node, right, to, to not risk the network with those pieces. So for pre-upgrade, you would point to the new repo, stage these new, or install these new pieces with it. And the nice thing about the Casper node launcher not having to upgrade is that you don't have to bring your node down, right, to stage. You can get the client there, you can get the sidecar running, and then the upgrade would happen. Uh, you could then upgrade the launcher at current or any future maintenance window. The upgrade staging of the actual 2.0 piece is going to be exactly the same as we've done before. Uh, we're pulling down the same config and binary packages. We're doing the same operations on them. So physically, as a node operator, other than installing that new sidecard piece, there really isn't anything new that you have to learn for the 2.0 piece. It'll be the same staging and, and simple there. So it should be pretty easy. Um, and we're testing multiple versions of it. One thing we'll also be doing with DevNet, as we get stabilized, uh, we'll be hosting DevNet packages and um, putting out information on if you want to stand up like a test node, join onto DevNet just to play with it, test those upgrades. Uh, that will be available for validators to kind of, you know, get a feel for that. So I think that's all I've got, Michael. Yeah, thank you uh, very much, Joe. And uh, that's uh, that's quite a bit. Uh, we only have about nine minutes left, and I see a ton of questions. Uh, so I'm going to pick and choose some uh, to try and get those answered while uh, still getting uh, some of you or all of you out of here on time. Um, let's start with this question to, I guess, Ed. Uh, are there any plans to write native events into a separate storage or log for replayability? No. There are plans to add support for native events around things uh, that are currently happening internally, but they would work the same way as the user land, which is to say they would write some checksums to global state and emit the message to the event stream. Uh, and the reason is to avoid um, essentially uh, bloat a global state. Um, so basically, the repudiation uh, would be there, but not the playback, right? You could say, uh, having followed the event stream, we're looking at uh, the recorded events. This um, uh, was emitted, but uh, if you then ask a node to confirm that, all it will confirm is that yes, it was, or no, it wasn't. It won't. It won't give you the message back, right? Got it. And the side start, the the sidecar storage is that just date of events, Ed? No, the sidecar uh, if the storage of events is turned on, it stores all events. So essentially, if you are if you are running the sidecar or you know someone else is, uh, and they are recording uh, the events, uh, then essentially it exposes its own uh, interface and you can ask for those recorded or you know stored messages. Uh, and so that's basically the thing. Yeah, so and, th that would be where they could be stored and then it has a REST interface where you could pull them, I think. So that, that would be a, a current solution, I think. Cor correct, it's not on the node itself. The node only stores the necessary information to keep it secure, but sidecar or you know any other similar 
indexer or event listener that's storing those messages as it perceives them uh, would record them. Uh, however, you know, if the last source, if let's say everyone turned off their sidecars uh, forever, uh, well, then those messages would be lost forever because it's ephemeral data, right? And nobody's listening to them, exactly. Correct. Um, okay, moving on, next question. Um, let's see, uh, Mihao, how will old contracts that use URFs work with the new VM? Uh, 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 if you turn that to make a distinction here uh, that URF is just basically an object which has address and uh, access bits. So when you will receive URF, uh, let's say you will, a new VM contract will call old VM contract to get some URF. Basically, we get a URF object, which is it is its address and its access bits. So that's one thing, right? And the other, other part of that is how do I retrieve data from that? So we should provide some um, some uh, mechanism to read data from URFs, although uh, it will be just read only, uh, hopefully, because there is some some issues with allowing writing to URFs, and it should be just for migrating the data, basically reading the the information uh, from old old one. Uh, right. So if you're writing a contract mm -hmm. that targets VM two, you should mm -hmm. not uh, write to URFs anymore. Yes. Right? Yes. Or, yes. Yeah. Yeah, well, it won't even let you. So okay. it basically will handle all that for you. Uh, yep. I mean, the simple thing to say is the new VM works by value, not by reference. So yes. um, it's a simpler programming model. Uh, and then if you're integrating with an older, uh, anything that was using URFs, then you are you would be able to get the value, but not the reference, right? Yes. Uh, well, we have Mihao. Uh... Keep your mic open. Next question for you is, will the new execution engine make it possible to write contracts that transfer native tokens from an account without a WASM proxy? Oh, OK, so, so this is a complicated question. So so there is probably many opinions, but I, I, will, just, you, I will just give you my opinion on that. So uh, new EE wouldn't allow you to transfer native tokens from an account. Um, and the hopefully, intended behavior of, of of that is that you should we, we should or the network should have uh, some emergent uh wrapped token uh running on the network with, with good liquidity so then uh since it's part of cp18 standard it has some notion of allowances so then basically you will authorize some contract to use your to wrap tokens on behalf of you but the native token will be just part of your account that and we wouldn't let contracts use yours, uh, hopefully. Uh, yeah. So, so I think yeah, the the wrap token should be probably the, the best, the safest, and the, the best solution for this problem. Well, I would splice that a little bit more friendly, right? So you already can transfer from an account natively without Wasm. Uh, so I don't, I don't think that's quite what they're asking. The the... No, I, th I think what they're asking is um, right now, if you want to transfer native CSPR to a contract that cannot be done through a uh, contract call directly, right? Like the, the account has to install a WASM proxy in order right. to. Right. So basically, the payable feature that uh, Mihao mentioned, mm -hmm. we're actually calling it transferable, but yeah. that does support that. You essentially, on the new VM, an entry point that implements the transferable uh, attribute will receive transferred token from the caller. If the caller is an account, uh, then essentially it is doing what you're asking. So the yes. account's not providing its own WASM. It's simply engaging with the host's capability and the plugged in contract support for that feature. And vice versa, if an account attempted to transfer a token to a contract entry point that does not implement that, what would actually occur is a check is performed that would error that uh, because it, the the contract doesn't receive a token, right? So, so I think the answer to that is yes, uh, and that is uh, already in the, the new VM. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, three minutes left and a bunch of questions. Sorry, Mia, if you wanted to add something to that. Uh, no, I think it's fine. Uh, yeah. um, actually, I'm, I'm going to wrap up your contribution, Mia, with this question from someone. Um, what are you going to do next? Because it's hard to imagine what else can be improved in smart contracts. Uh, there's, uh, 
So th that depends on the use cases and that depends on the general blockchain uh, movement. Like the, the, there is a lot of research in, in many parts of, of that. For, for instance, um, there is very popular, uh, like probably most of the blockchain suffers some notion of zero knowledge proofs. <clears throat> so then at this time, it's fair to add some kind of support for computing zero knowledge proofs. But we don't know in a few years what will be the, the emerging tech uh, that blockchains will support maybe some something uh, un uh, unimaginable now, right? But at some point we will have to support uh, this. And that's that's one thing. Uh, other things is just optimize it. Like if we will optimize the underlying PM, then it will translate, it should translate to lower costs. And there is just uh, a lot of stuff you can do based on the on, on the APIs, on the SDK, on the on the other parts. So there is still there is a lot of improvements you can make. Uh, at you add thumbs, uh, I meant to do a thumbs up and it did a hands up and said, but yeah, oh, no, I agree. Yes, yeah, so, yeah. I think the best answer is um, the the new VM is leaner, meaner, uh, simpler, but. Uh, if people engage with the way we hope they do, they will have feature requests. Yes. Uh, and also, um, you know, uh, we intend to, to basically stay competitive and current where the existing VM, we really couldn't do that. Uh, it's just the, the technology became dated over the years and the new VM is uh, very oriented towards uh, staying a, a, an, on top of emergent trends, right? And so that's essentially the goal is, and then also, as we mentioned earlier, the big, I mean, the, the VM itself is quite a big lift, but also the architecture itself was changed to make uh, multi VMs pluggable. Uh, so essentially, in addition to the new VM, uh, we also have the ability to uh, plug in other VMs also, right, to run other kinds of smart contracts or other not necessarily smart contracts, just processing targets. Like there's some processing work um, that we want to facilitate uh, through a, a transaction. Yeah. Thank so, you. Yeah. Uh, we, we are officially over time, but I want to rapid fire some questions to Joe and please give me like 10 second answers on each uh, because these are some questions that are highly relevant for validators. Uh, when are we switching to the latest Ubuntu LTS? The catch there is that we have OpenSSL 1.0 and 3.0, and we're going to look at building multiple versions for them. Likely, we're going to stay on 20.04 with possibilities of installing OpenSSL 1 on 20 on higher versions, basically, until probably a few months down the road. Thank you. Uh, any detailed telemetry or diagnostics tooling coming up? How are you measuring network health internally during development? Uh, right now, we look at our metrics on the pieces. We're doing a little update to metrics to try and help that. Um, hopefully, I'll have time to flush out CNM a little better. Um, to, that's usually what we use for network health analysis. Uh, thank you. Uh, what was exactly limiting the delegator capacity? The technical details, please. And is it gone with 2.0? I assume this refers to the 1,200 delegator limit on validator nodes. Yeah, Ed, you want to touch that quick? Yeah, the I mean they want technical details. Basically, it's size and time. So I think we upped it to, I don't know, fifteen hundred or something like that for two. But basically, it takes disk space and also processing time every uh, step function. So the primary limiter is simply performance. And uh, you know, well, we can continue to push it up uh, incrementally. But we've also implemented. Some other features like allowing validators to set a minimum uh, bid uh, and uh, uh, also to uh, use uh, the ability to set up like a reservation or whitelist for specific delegators that they want to hold space for. So, I mean, it can't be infinite. Uh, and so it's just a matter of, you know, what's the sweet spot, right? So that's kind of yeah. where it is. Yeah, and and those uh, validator functions that that I just described, we we haven't really talked about, but that will be uh, communicated more in uh, upcoming documentation, uh, where you as a validator can really uh, do a couple of things, uh, including reserve slots for specific uh, delegators and and or set uh, minimum and maximum uh, delegation amounts, etc., in order to really manage what uh, what type of uh, delegators you're looking to serve with your uh, validation uh, services.
Uh, now we're three minutes over time, and I know that there's still a lot of questions left. I don't think we will get to all of them, uh, or I know we won't, but uh, just the last uh, thing to wrap up with, uh, and I'm combining a few questions here. Um, realistic ETA for 2.0 hitting mainnet. Can we bring 2.0 on testnet ASAP and keep it there longer than usual? What are expected rough dates for the upgrade, et cetera? Um, so we'll, st we'll start with saying this where uh, we were, uh, well, we're expecting to cut RC5 next week. Uh, Joe described what's going to happen next, which is DevNet. Um, Joe, in your estimation, uh, like what's, what's the time frame from DevNet to testnet uh, happy path? Well, the, the biggest piece there is, you know, we lead on the ecosystem and when they're ready to move forward, that's going to be our biggest limiting factor. Um, once you start up the integration test, testnet, mainnet path, you've essentially blocked the 1x for any patch yeah. releases. We don't expect to have any, but you never do. Uh, so we have to be happy that we're flowing through with that. Once we have the go ahead uh, in integration test, it's not gonna be long because DevNet is essentially that. And so the expectation is we would idle and test net for some time, right, as ecosystem compares to there. Um, I'm not sure what uh, the current forecast is for getting all the ecosystem pieces there. I think Dev and uh, Adrian and things may have a, a, a better look at that. Uh, as far as moving forward. Technically, there's not going to be more than a couple of weeks uh, for our limitations. Uh, and, I think. And, and, and I'll just add to that, and again, it, it's probably not as uh, definitive an answer as you may be looking for, but uh, it is uh, my strong desire, objective, and uh, expectation that uh, we're out with 2.0 in this current calendar quarter. Uh, mm -hmm. meaning before the end of the year. So that is uh, that is the aim that we're all working towards um, and we all believe is uh, realistic. So I'll leave it at that. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll put one more button on that. When we go from DevNet to TestNet, prior to that, we will merge the feature branch V2.0 to Dev, right? And once we do yeah. that, that's that's the Rubicon. That's the path and over, of, you know, the path and over turn, right? Uh, so basically, that'll be a significant event. Um, and then once it's in testnet, it's really a matter for the validators when they're comfortable. That's when it can go to mainnet. Uh, however, the the long constraint is there's some breaking changes. And so some SDK developers and tool developers and so forth uh, will need to come up to speed. They can be coming up to speed now in DevNet. Um, but if they wait until testnet or if they need more time, uh, well, then, you know, that has to play out. But from like a mechanism, a feature complete point of view, uh, the RC5 cut uh, is uh, almost is like 90 something feature complete right now. The, the one additional feature coming in um, for the uh, uh, the the contracts uh, staking behavior, and that's it. And then at that point, it's bugs. If people find bugs, we of course have to fix them, right? Yeah. So that's where we're at. Um, thanks, Ed, and thank you, everybody, for joining. I realized that we had probably more content and definitely more questions that we could fit in uh, this one hour. Um, we'll go through the questions and um, see if we can perhaps answer some of them in the write-up that will follow. Um, this uh, You should expect this to be a regularly uh, recurring uh, meeting, especially as we get closer to the launch as well. Uh, in one of the upcoming meetings, I also want to uh, spend some time talking about sort of the the governance uh, initiatives that we've um, announced, where you as validators will play a major role. Um, but that's uh, that's for the future. Uh, in the meantime, thank you very much for joining. Thank you for everything you do uh, for the network on behalf of your delegators, uh, and uh, a big thanks to uh, the core engineering team that was on here. Uh, look forward to doing this uh, with all of you uh, soon again. Thank you. Bye.